in Northern Ireland you can have an abortion right to the point of birth. Now, that's incredible. Every other Western state, from you, whether it's the United States of America, whether it's some of our, our colleagues in our neighbouring states in the European Union, the average um, date for a, uh, an abortion is less than 12 weeks or around 12 weeks mark. We already double that in the UK and in Northern Ireland, a socially conservative place, we're saying right to the point of birth. We have had this um, ultra-liberal regime inflicted on us because at a point of crisis, the British government didn't have the guts to stand firm and they bent over backwards to a very radical liberal agenda. Coming up on British Thought Leaders, I sit down with Ian Paisley, MP for North Antrim and member of the Democratic Unionist Party. Ian talks about why his party is boycotting the Windsor framework, which is widely supported by other Northern Irish political parties. Under the Windsor framework, um, to keep our food and our livestock, our animal livestock healthy, we, we um, use certain drugs and certain veterinary medicines. Uh, those veterinary medicines under EU law become illegal in Northern Ireland at the end of this year. Right. Now, that means that 50% of all of our veterinary products will cease to be available to our farmers. Now, that affects our ability, therefore, to make the foods that are necessary for the rest of the UK. He talks about the challenges of being a man of faith in frontline politics. Whenever people are at a point of crisis, the first thing they turn to is not, not to a radical government, but they turn for something inside of them. They look for faith. I'm Lee Hall. This is British Thought Leaders. Ian Paisley, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thank you. It's been a quarter of a century since the Belfast Agreement. And your father, who founded the DUP, was famously against the agreement. Um, but 25 years on, I mean, it's been credited with bringing peace. What are your thoughts on the situation? Well, my father was probably one of the giants of British and Irish politics, to be fair. And it really took him to uh, bring the, the country to a point where the two main tribes, if you like, could come together and ultimately make peace. And yes, we did oppose the Belfast Agreement. Uh, we opposed it because it let prisoners out of jail um, and uh, unrepentant prisoners at, at that. And that, that it uh, reformed or changed dramatically our police service, which today we're now reaping the consequences of. And of course, it created a system of government, which surprisingly doesn't work. And we said that at the time, and today we don't have a government in Northern Ireland. But the, the, the benefit of the last 25 years undoubtedly has been that Republicans stopped murdering Unionists, stopped bombing towns, stopped blowing up the city of London. And that, that certainly was a huge benefit. And given that the government had embarked on a strategy to negotiate a peace as opposed to end a, a, a war, uh, which essentially the conflict was. Um, we lived with the consequences, and the consequences is compromise. Um, political compromises, which are hard for people to take, but nonetheless it has brought a level of stability. And statistically, it's fascinating. You're, you're more likely, um, uh, Northern Ireland is a much more stable and peaceful place than cities like Manchester, <laughs> you know, if you measure certain crime levels. Yeah. So, you know, in terms of today, 25 years later, nor at the time, the, the country that I grew up in, which was you know, ravaged by terrorism is now one of the most peaceful places in the United Kingdom. So the benefits are untold. I mean, my, my community benefit most from that because our neighbouring community stopped killing us. Do you think people in the other UK nations understand what their compatriots in Northern Ireland went through? No. And I, I don't say that lightly and I, I don't dismiss, but when you're not living through it, it's very much a place apart. And Northern Ireland, because it was separated by that little piece of sea, um, meant that it was always over there. And we've got funny accents, and we're, we're not quite the same. Uh, and that that meant that you know, the attitude was was always different. It was a place apart. Uh, I, I know they don't fully understand it, and they don't probably fully understand um, then the impact that has on subsequent generations. Uh, I mean, most people are uh, know someone in their family or neighbour or friend who perished or was badly injured in the Troubles. Uh, they certainly know businesses and towns that they grew up in that was troubled bad. Th thank God that has all changed and we've moved forward. But the memory of that is an immediate memory. But, but there's also great positives. You know, my, my children, for example, have grown up in a very peaceful Northern Ireland. Uh, the Troubles is ancient history to them to a large degree. 
uh, and that's largely, I think, down to parenting that kept them away from that. Mm -hmm. But uh, the mainland, uh, my, my cousins and friends here on, on, on UK mainland don't always understand the burden of that and, and the baggage that has been carried with it. It seems generally things are going pretty well in Northern Ireland. I know the exam results came out, and once again, you're at the top of the tree with that. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have, look, we have a very young, dynamic population, which now mixes exceptionally well. You know, uh, uh, Catholics and Protestants get educated together, they work together, they socialise and party and have fun together, and uh, in, in some areas grow up together. There still is a lot of segregation, mind you, and there's segregation at schooling level. Um, but yes, the, the, uh, it, it's a real bonus that Northern Ireland has a young, dynamic, well-educated population. And about 33% of our university-ready population actually move to England or Scotland and get their uh, third level and higher level education here on the mainland. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them don't come back, so we, we, we lose that talent. Um, they meet friends, they get married, they settle down, they have good jobs here. Uh, we'd love to win that population back, or more importantly, have sufficient university places that they don't have to go away. Because mm -hmm. by and large, w if, if you ever come to Northern Ireland, you ever visit Northern Ireland, you ever work here, you find that it's, um, in terms of comparators to the rest of the United Kingdom, it's a brilliant place to raise children. It's less expensive than the rest of the British mainland, but your quality of life and your pound that goes further in, in Northern Ireland I mean, it gives you a much more significant, beneficial life. And I, I must say this, you know, at the moment I have full employment in my constituency. I have about 3% unemployed. Yeah. I mean, uh, so it's a thriving, dynamic place. Uh, and when there isn't the troubles going on, it's, it's out of sight, out of mind. And I would love my English, Scottish and Welsh compatriots to play a much more detailed interest in, in the politic of Northern Ireland so they understand the, the nuances of what we go through at time. Because I certainly take a very deep interest in what happens in England, Scotland and Wales. And as, as unionists, I think it's important that we should do that. So you're part of the Centre for the Union, which is a think tank focused on preserving the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. I mean, what's so important about the union? Uh, well, yes, I'm the parliamentary chairman of the Centre for the Union. It's uh, an exceptionally good think tank. I would say that, wouldn't I? But it tries to get people to think of those issues of how do we think as unionists, small u unionists, as Welsh people, as Scottish people, as English people, as Northern Irish people, how do we think collectively? There was a great slogan during the Scottish referendum in 2014, it's you know, stronger together. Mm. I think that's the essence of the union. You know, as individual portions, as individual nations, or as individual states, yes, yes, we're very attractive, yes, we have our own unique way of doing things, but the union is about pluralism. It's about sharing our talents, mixing our talents, and making the United Kingdom better. I mean, why is the red, white, and blue of the Union flag so dynamic and pattern? Because it's a mixture of people coming together and kingdoms coming together and saying together we are stronger, we can add much more to each other. And the, the Union culturally, the Union politically, the, the Union economically is dynamic and strong. I mean, a little part of Northern Ireland, a little part of Ireland, how could it be part of the fifth largest economy of the world? Because it's part of the union. Benefits from that. That's just the economic aspect of it. How could we culturally have a much more thriving and buzzing uh, cultural identity and social identity? It's because we're part of the union and we're, we're, we are able to mix the cultures of our entire kingdom, whether it's Scottish music with Ulster music or um, English dance. You know, It all comes together and we have that as a, a collective and I think culturally and economically and socially, it is such a powerful identity. And um, oh, we, we do box well above our weight as, 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 uh, in that regard. I got the impression when I was in Northern Ireland that people there probably support the union more than the other countries, even England, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we definitely are. I think, uh, you know, the island of Ireland used to be called Little Britain. <laughs> you know, it's the smaller island, it's the little Britannia. And I think that has definitely rubbed off. Now, there's a historical reasons for, for that. For 40 years of the last 100, if you're under threat and your identity is under threat and you're bombed and you're shot at, that does make you more stronger <laughs> in terms of your identity. That's ended, 25 years. But that feeling that, you know, our forefathers have really died for this, you know, this, this isn't a gift from the English to us. This is ours as of right. 
We determine that we are British. It is ours. We influence what Britishness is. And I think there is a very strong feeling um, that uh, Northern Ireland's sense of Britishness is palpably more stronger than in other parts of the UK. And, uh, you know, that's part of our history. It's also probably part of the kind of identity of Ulster people. We're quite thrown. What does that word mean? We're quite stubborn. <laughs> and we're a stubborn people, you know, and it comes through. But I think we also um, contribute well to the identity of the UK. Kind of the same with the monarchy, really. I think people in Northern Ireland like the monarchy maybe more than the other nations. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, His Majesty the King is held in significant regard in, in Northern Ireland, as was uh, the late Majesty, her, the, the, the Queen. Um, I, I had the honour of speaking to the King uh, on the week of his coronation, and I said, don't forget Northern Ireland. And he said, how could I? You know, he, he hears it, he, and he sees it, and he understands the loyalty of the people of Northern Ireland. And that's a cross-community loyalty. You know, the, the monarchy has been able, especially in recent years, to set themselves above the hurly-burly and the noise of ordinary politics and be seen as a collective and a unifying force in a country that has a divided uh, community. I mean, the Northern Ireland community, while it's, it's one people, we are divided on our nationalist and unionist outlook. But the monarchy has stepped in over the top of that and said, you know, I, I can still be your king, whether you're a nationalist or a unionist. Yeah. August is traditionally the time when uh, people from Stormont uh, take their breaks, but the Assembly hasn't uh, had a proper meeting for 18 months now. Uh, your party has uh, walked away in protest against the Windsor framework. What is it about the framework that you feel it's worth boycotting the power-sharing agreement over? Well, if, if we were currently in Stormont, we would be implementing the framework by law. Our ministers would have to implement it. And if you're a unionist minister, having to implement something which undermines the union would be anathema. So uh, we took this difficult stand because I'm a devolutionist. I think local politicians running local affairs is a really good and positive thing. So we took this stand to push back against... Um, uh, running the, the assembly until we get changes to the Windsor framework. Why are we opposed to it? Let me give you two very practical things. Uh, first of all, our largest business is making food, agri agricultural farming, and then farm um, productivity and producing food in, into um, products which people buy. So um, farm gate is exceptionally important. Uh, there's less than 30,000 farms in Northern Ireland. We feed 17 million people. Mm. That 17 million people is on the British mainland. Mm. That's our business, that's our shop. And we provide the UK, therefore, with food security. It's traceable, good, tasty British food made in Northern Ireland, made for the people of the United Kingdom. Under the Windsor framework, um, to keep our food and our livestock, our animal livestock, healthy, we, we um, use certain drugs and certain veterinary medicines. Uh, those veterinary medicines, under EU law, become illegal in Northern Ireland at the end of this year. Right. Now, that means that 50% of all of our veterinary products will cease to be available to our farmers. Now, that affects our ability, therefore, to make the foods that are necessary for the rest of the UK. It stops our farm businesses from succeeding. And it then says to our competitors, who happen to be in the south of Ireland, there's a market of 17 million people. Do you want to take it? So this is an economic war uh, which, which we are now in, and we have to have this resolved. If we don't have our agri-foods, agri-veterinary medicines resolved, Northern Ireland's agri-food business will collapse. And uh, not only does it affect um, agricultural, it also affects pets and animals, and we're a nation of animal lovers, as you know. And that um, will also be affected dramatically, but the big end issue is in our, in our food productivity. Then take horticultural product. Um, we're a very green island, we get a lot of water, a lot of rain, and that allows us to grow um, certain plants in a particularly good um, way. We also bring plant from the rest of the UK, from GB, into Northern Ireland. That's been stopped. We've been told that the brains, plants, seed potatoes and other products into Northern Ireland with British soil on it would contaminate potentially the EU. So to take a plant from one part of the UK and take it to another part of the UK and to be told by an official the soil in that contaminates potentially the Republic of Ireland even though it's for Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. That is a disgrace. So I'm actually dealing with a constituent at the moment who can't bring 
um, horticultural products that their family have had for over 80 years from their house in uh, England to their new house in Northern Ireland because it might contaminate the EU. It's appalling. Uh, and that then says to people, we're not really British. Um, we pay the same taxes, we're in the same regime, but actually you're not really British. Now that then affects the psyche of the public. So the third issue therefore is identity. Much more nebulous, we can fix the veterinary medicines, we can fix this horticultural issue, we can fix all the friction of trade issues which go on, but fixing the issue of identity, where your identity's been given a punch in the chin and you, you feel that your Britishness has been unsettled, that's much harder and the government has a real task of work, in my view, to do something to say, that was a mistake, you're very much part and parcel, you're an integ integral part of the United Kingdom, we want you and we want you to know that and we won't put in place laws that ever damage that relationship again. Um, we've had enough of this friction of our trade. You know, all of our business, 80% of Northern Ireland's business is done with England, Scotland and Wales. 10% of it is done with the Republic of Ireland and 10% is done with the rest of the world. We really need to focus on where our real business is done. Based on that, it sounds like it will also be a problem for the whole UK, really, if Northern Ireland is the, the breadbasket for the UK. Well, they, they haven't quite grasped this. That, you know, if, if you lose potentially 17 million, um, the ability to feed 17 million people in, in GB, where's GB on a food security issue with a, a war going in Western Europe? Where's it going to get its food from? You know, th this does have significant food security issues for, for the UK. And they need to grasp that. And of course, typical, we wait till the last minute until the problem flags up. We're flagging it up early. It's then fix it now. That would be one of the ways of helping us to restore normality in our trade, fix the other issues to do with identity, and we will be able then to move on with hopefully getting back to good government in Northern Ireland. What are the chances, do you think, of you returning to the power sharing agreement anytime soon? Well, we've put these issues to the government. Uh, my party leader, I think, has put together a 38, 40 page document going through each of these issues of how it impacts trade, solutions to those issues. Um, that ball is at the government's foot. It's up to them to now kick it and to decide what to do. And dribbling along isn't going to resolve this. They need to make a decisive strike of the ball and fix this issue for us. Otherwise, I fear we will roll into an election and the election will um, uh, put people at loggerheads again and will not resolve the issue. I, I stress the record, my party wants devolution up and running. We play a significant role in that. Uh, we are, will be a significant player. Our political class will be part of the government of Northern Ireland. We're, we're, we're not doing this for spite. We're doing this because we care. The thinking behind the uh, boycotting of the Windsor framework is that people in Northern Ireland deserve the same rights as the rest of the UK. But there have been times when your party's been fighting for the opposite of that, one obvious one being the abortion laws that Westminster imposed on Northern Ireland. And the DUP's always been a party with traditional values. And how do you justify the kind of the different approach on issues such as that? Yeah, yeah no, no, I think that's a fair point. Um, these issues of social morality um, and social conservatism, as, as you've pointed out, they're actually issues which are, believe it or not, res um, supposed to be retained by the devolved settlement. So the issues like this in Scotland are for devolution. Issues of like this in Wales and Northern Ireland are for devolution. And the, the government decided um, that they would actually step in while there was no assembly in Northern Ireland and rule on these issues. They, they d did a consultation, however, of the people of Northern Ireland on issues to do with uh, uh, abortion. And it was the largest public consultation ever across the board. People from the nationalist tradition and the Roman Catholic identity in Northern Ireland, people from the Protestant and the Unionist identity. And that consultation was very clear that they didn't want the changes. But the government went on ahead and put the changes in place. And it's one thing saying, be the same as the rest of the United Kingdom. And I, and I get that. It's hard for me to swallow if the rest of the UK takes a, a different view on some of these social mor mor moral questions. But whenever you actually put in place in Northern Ireland, an even more liberal regime. So I'll give you an example. And here in the United Kingdom, you know, you can't have an abortion over 24 weeks like this. In Northern Ireland, you can have an abortion right to the point of birth. Now, that's incredible. Every other Western state, from the, whether it's the United States of America, whether it's some of our, our colleagues in our neighboring states in the European Union, the average um, date for a, uh, an abortion is less than 12 weeks or around the 12 weeks mark. 
we already double that in the UK, and in Northern Ireland, a socially conservative place, we're saying right to the point of birth. Now, there actually is a case to be made that the UK medium of 24 weeks should be brought down um, and more in line with the rest of Europe, and more in line with America and with other countries. But instead, we have had this um, ultra-liberal regime inflicted on us because at a point of crisis, the British government didn't have the guts to stand firm and they bent over backwards to a very radical liberal agenda uh, pushed by a committee in the European uh, in Europe called CEDAW, which said this is where it should really be. Now, what that has done is it allowed radicals in, here in GB to say the extreme laws that are now in place in Northern Ireland should be applied to the rest of GB, whenever actually all of the polling suggests that GB wants to pull back on those, some of those liberal laws. But they've done the opposite of us, and they, and they did it to punish us. They did it to say, oh, if you had not an assembly, you could do this yourself. The consequence for real lives for unborn children is uh, atrocious. Um, the stats in America are something like a million abortions last year, and yet there's four million people on the waiting list for adoption. <laughs> you know, Northern Ireland's something similar in terms of statistical terms, not the same numbers, but you know, there's more people waiting for adoption. Uh, abortion has increased dramatically, something like tenfold in Northern Ireland, and uh, yet there are people waiting to have um, uh, to adopt children. There are solutions to this. I've never believed that abortion is a, um, in this modern day and age, is something that, that should be tolerated as a way of birth control. And unfortunately, that's what that's become. And instead of saying to people, you know, first of all, young men to control yourselves, and to uh, women to be strong, and if they have a, a pregnancy which they don't want, there are alternatives to killing that unwanted life, because there are. And I think that we need to stand strong on those issues. You're a man of faith. Um, uh, the world has changed drastically in recent years. Is it difficult to balance your, your faith and beliefs with being in frontline politics? I, I think honestly, yes. I, I think, yes, it's challenged uh, every day. Um, people don't sometimes want to hear um, things which come from faith. But where does our law come from? Where does the law, thou shalt not steal, come from? Where does the law, thou shalt not cheat? Where does the law, um, don't murder? comes from somewhere. Well, um, the Old Testament teaches me it came in Exodus, you know, and you know, it came from God. And those good tenets, which are about state control and are about social management of communities and people, they, they came from God and they came in love to us. And yes, as a person of faith, um, they, they can be challenged. But I, I, whenever people are at a point of crisis, the first thing they turn to is not, not to a radical government, but they turn for something inside of them. They look for faith. And I, I think in this day and age, whilst faith has always been challenged and will be challenged even more in, in, in this day and age, we, we actually can offer certainty and hope to people which can't be offered by anything else. Uh, I mean, uh, the, a, a God that loves you and cares for you is a, uh, and, and is there in those times of crisis when everything else has failed you is something which people can't put their anchor of faith in. Your father was a, a, a giant of politics. It, did it make it an, an obvious career path for you to go down and was it easy to follow in his footsteps? Um, great question. Uh, look, I've four other siblings. I've, I've actually a twin brother uh, who's a minister of, uh, of, of religion and I've got three sisters. One of my sisters was in politics for a period of time. Uh, she was a councillor for 12 years. My mother was in elected politics as well and was actually president of the party for a period of time. And she finished up in the House of Lords. Um, so we're a very political family. So I certainly had an interest. And the fact that I wanted to do it, I probably had a head start. And I did want to do it. I, from as a young kid, seeing Parliament and seeing what went on there, I was fascinated by it and got an interest in it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I've always, I think, had my feet on the ground that it's actually about service. It's about representing and being an articulate voice for people who can't be that, and for representing your community and achieving things for them, and knowing the way route through to get things done for them. And I suppose I had a master class watching my father doing that, and whenever I had the interest in it, he didn't discourage it. Um, and uh, the machinery that he put in place politically 
um, he handed to me in my own constituency, and uh, it's been a you know the fact that I've wanted to do it. I think has been a head start because of the background I've, I've had. But you still have to prove yourself, and ultimately, you still have to persuade the public to vote for you. And I think if I was a useless, inept politician, they wouldn't vote for me and give me the support that they do give me. And I've been very, very honoured to have their support, and hopefully, will continue to have it in the future. Were there any particular lessons they taught you that have, have stuck with you throughout your political life? Yeah, I suppose it's more of a, a, a moral lesson, and that is the time is short. You know, and it's not a dress rehearsal. This is for real. Every single day, get on with it. Um, have purpose in your life. Uh, our catechism teaches us what is your chief end in life? Well, it's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, and to put the joy in what you do, even if it's a, a task that can be humdrum. Do it with joy, with a smile and with a twinkle in your eye, and you will get through life a lot more. I always carry one of my dad's watches with me, all times, um, because it, uh, it, he was a bit of a collector, but he, my mum gave me that watch when, uh, when I turned 50, and it was my dad's watch, and it just reminds me of the time is short. And, uh, you know, it's, only, it's the only thing we own in our life is our time. And once it's gone, it's gone forever. So use it wisely. Ian Paisley, thank you for joining us on British Thought Leaders. Thank you.